Hello, greetings everyone. What an absolutely great crowd. This is wonderful to see all of you. I'd like to welcome you to the 19th Heilborn series. Uh, my name is Michael Schmidt. I'm the chair of the department, and my pleasure today is to introduce the most senior member of our faculty, Professor Kamal Seth. The reason I want to introduce him is that he's been the one who, over the last 19 years, has shepherded the Heilborn series from a curiosity to really one of the most important items on our academic calendar. It's truly been a great success and has made a huge difference to students, postdocs, and faculty, and many others inside the Department of Physics and Astronomy. So, Kem, in recognition of the amazing job you've done with the Heilborn series, and on behalf of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, I would like to present to you with this plaque. I'd like to read, please, what it says. Walter and Christine Halborn Lecture Series, Department of Physics and Astronomy, Northwestern University, to Professor Kamal Seth, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University, given in gratitude for your exceptional service, 2001 to 2019. Thank you. I repeat the welcome to the Heilborn Lectures for this year, 2018-19, to all of you. And I am greatly gratified by the large attendance of people who are here, who apparently love physics in one way or another. So let, let me begin with... Uh, telling you a little bit about the Heilborn Lectures. This lecture series was started in the year 2001 by the establishment of a fund created by George Heilborn. George Heilborn was an alumnus of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern. He created this fund in memory of his parents, Walter and Christine Heilborn, and he asked us to establish a series of annual lectures devoted to the presentation of the great discoveries of physics by inviting a distinguished lecturer who would visit the physics department for several days and present a series of lectures on the important discoveries of physics. Whenever I say physics, I mean physics and astronomy. Uh, he would also uh, interact with the students, faculty, and researchers, and would also present a popular lecture for the general public. Uh, let me continue. The lecture series is now 18 years old, and it has become one of the, sorry, uh, and it's, uh, it has become one of the most distinguished events in the university's academic calendar. Under its auspices, 12 Nobel Prize winners have come to Northwestern. Past lecturers have included announcements of uh, the discoveries of many fundamental particles uh, and of the expansion of the universe and of the acceleration of the expansion. Today's lecture is about the identification of gravitation radiation. Uh, during these last years, last few years, I have had the privilege of organizing and shepherding these lectures. Uh, so let me go on. Uh, hmm? button is not working. Okay. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
As I mentioned, this has been a very successful series of lectures, and it has attracted, as the speakers, some of the greatest uh, physicists and astronomers in the world. Here is a little list. Uh, it was supposed to be a little larger, but uh, let's see. Uh, perhaps you can see the names. Uh, you may not make out exactly. But the speakers have come from all over the world and have talked about discoveries in physics, uh, ranging, as I said, from discovery of fundamental particles uh, all the way down to discovery of, uh, uh, of uh, universal expansion. And today, uh, the talk is devoted uh, to the greatest, one of the greatest discoveries in the field of astrophysics, namely detection of gravitation radiation. And I think this will work. Uh, the talk will be given today by our speaker, Rainer Weiss, from, uh, who is Professor Emeritus, oops, who is Professor Emeritus at MIT, and he is also the Nobel Prize winner for the year 2017. The topic of his lecture is exploring the universe with gravitational waves. He'll be introduced by one of his collaborators, Professor Vicky Caragora of our own department. And I will now turn over the microphone to Vicky. Please. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's lecture. It's a great pleasure for me and honor to introduce to you uh, this year's Halborn lecturer, uh, Professor Rainer Weiss. Uh, uh, Ray Weiss is coming to us from MIT where he spent all of, most of his uh, professional career. He started there as an undergraduate student, uh, completed his uh, graduate studies, got his PhD while towards the end of his PhD years also was an instructor at Tufts University. Then he moved away for a couple of years and went to Princeton University as a postdoctoral associate and came back to, uh, went back to MIT as an assistant professor where he's been for uh, all his professional life, as I said. Ray Weiss is really a uh, transformative figure in physics and astronomy. Uh, he has managed through his years to uh, pioneer and bring to maturity two completely different fields of physics and astronomy. Uh, the area of cosmic microwave background and the study of cosmology through the detection of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, he built and also was the intellectual uh, father uh, of COBE, a NASA mission that made the first uh, detection of that spectrum in the 70s and the 80s. And then in parallel from the 60s through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and this decade, he's been working uh, on this uh, now uh, finally nascent observational astronomy field uh, of gravitational wave detection and astronomy and astrophysics. And for this work, in 2017, he received uh, the Nobel Prize uh, along with Barry uh, Barish and Kip Thorne from Caltech. Of course, along the uh, years, he has received numerous, numerous, numerous awards. It's impossible to list them all, uh, both for his work on COBE and the cosmic microwave background, but also for his work on gravitational uh, waves. I will mention only a couple of things. Uh, the Einstein Prize from the American Physical uh, Society, and also uh, the fact that he's on the only physicist who has received the um, Gruber Prize in cosmology twice for his work in these two different fields. Um, it is uh, uh, a, a great pleasure to uh, introduce him also because not only for all this excellent work, but also because in our community, the gravitational wave, physics and astronomy community, he has impacted the lives of numerous um, uh, young scientists uh, and engineers. 
Uh, he has mentored many um, of us in our community, either directly by advising uh, lots of people in the lab, but also from a distance. We all know him and admire him from a distance and, and, and watch him how he works and how he works uh, uh, almost like a graduate student in the trenches, we often say. And he still does this, and that's what makes him most happy uh, to this day. And we love to always see him at our conferences. And uh, of course, we loved this week to have him here at Northwestern every day. So please join me in welcoming him, Ray. Yeah. Have we got him? Okay. Wow. Um, to, uh, to celebrate the uh, coming of uh, Professor Weiss to Northwestern, we present him a plaque so that he'll remember us. Uh, <laughs> this is a plaque which says to Professor Rainer Weiss, Professor of Physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, as uh, for the uh, Walter and Heilborn um, distinguished uh, as Walter and Heilborn distinguished lecturer in the Department of Physics at Northwestern University for the year 2018 and 19. Uh, with that short introduction, I want to turn this over to the uh, speaker himself, Professor Weiss. We are so grateful to you for honoring us by coming to our lecture series. And uh, please, the stage is up to you now. Well, thank you very much. And it's been a, actually a real pleasure to be here. Um, and you know, given a thing like this means that I have better give a good talk, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. I, uh, thank you again. Uh, so, OK. Uh, by the way, before I give my talk, I'd like to encourage you, and this is actually for you as well, when there's another Heilborn speaker, and it happens to be a she and not a he, you better change what you say in your introduction. <laughs> OK? <laughs> All right. And that's not a criticism. I just sort of said to myself, one of these days, there's going to be a she, and so you can't use those words. Okay. Enough. Uh, look, uh, I, I'm very honored to give this talk. I, and uh, the thing is, what's it about is really a thing that belongs to all of you in the end. It's a new field of science that has been opened up, not by me alone, by any means. It meant you'll see that there's something called on behalf of the LIGO scientific collaboration. That means something. And I think I can show you something of that collaboration. It's about 70 institutions. Here is Northwestern right there, and that's because of Vicky. But there are others. And these people actually make this happen. I just happen to be a symbol for them. OK, you have to remember that. And uh, so let me start, since this is a popular talk, to try to bring you into it without being too fancy, OK? So the guy you all know, because of those of you who went to high school, and probably in physics courses here is this character right there. That's Isaac Newton. And he had a very interesting theory of gravity. And was, he was more profound than you might think. What he did is he coupled what went on in front of him, like the apocryphal apple that fell out of the tree, with the fact that the moon was going around the Earth. And those two things were very disparate ideas. They didn't call it gravity, but it was they didn't have, people had not made the connection that the motion of the moon was the same thing as driving the apple into the ground. And that was a profound idea in physics. It was a profound idea that said, look, there's a universality in physics. And one thing even more, that the evil Earth, which we live on, had something to do with the pristine heavens. That was also quite a groundbreaker, I have to tell you. So now, we embody or the law of gravity, which Newton developed, in this equation. 
and it's, I think, equation many of you know, but let me just walk with you through it. It says there's a force of gravity, and it's proportional to if you have two people sitting next to each other, it, and you want to say, what is the force of attraction? And I'm not talking about what right away you think. No, just they, they do pull on each other. Uh, they, they depend on the mass of one and the mass of the other, and it gets weaker the further apart they are. That is, goes with the square of that distance. It's a very good law. It did everything we ever needed in this world. It got us to the moon. It does pretty much explain everything that goes on in the solar system. You don't need anything else, most people would have thought. It doesn't work in certain places. For example, I know how many of you, I'm sure many of you own cell phones, and you find your way around the city by looking at the cell phone GPS. Some of you do. That GPS wouldn't work very well if you didn't have the next guy. That's Einstein. That's important because we'll talk a little about what Einstein did to change this. The other thing is, and this is much more esoteric, is that all of Newton didn't quite work right, even at the time of Einstein's life. There was a problem with the planet Mercury. It didn't do the right thing exactly. It did it so well, most people didn't give a damn. It looked like that equation. But if you really were fussy, it wasn't good enough. And then when Einstein came up with when he started thinking about physics, it didn't do some very important things for him. And they were, and I'll tell you what they are as I show you Einstein and also his equation. Now Einstein realized that you couldn't use Newton for very large masses going at a very high velocity. It doesn't work. And the other thing it didn't have is it didn't have a news function. It didn't have a way of transmitting information in one place where gravity is doing something to another place. And what I mean by that is, and I'll give you an example. If uh, the sun suddenly disappeared, you all would know it, not right away. You would know it about nine or eight minutes after it happened. Why? Because it takes light about that long, eight or nine minutes, to travel from the sun to get to the Earth. Now. That people would have known already by the time Einstein was a boy. But the other thing is that what they would not have realized is the following. When if you ask people, now if you had asked this of Newton, he might have given you a reasonable answer. He would have puzzled about it. But the people who followed him, here's the project, here's the problem you want to think about. Here's the sun, and here's the earth going around the sun. Okay? It's going, let's say, in a circle. Let's not worry about ellipses. We don't need that. And so, OK, you throw the Earth away, and all of a sudden, what happens? Let me do it again. No, you throw the sun away. What happens? This thing goes off on a tangent. It doesn't go around the circle. Let's do it once more. Here's the circle, and bing, you take the sun away. It goes off on a straight line where the sun went away immediately. And that can't happen with Einstein, because it takes information, even if it's gravitational information, just nine minutes to get to the Earth. You have to include that. So that is in the very short order, what is a gravitational wave, and we'll talk a lot more about it. But let me, before I start with that, tell you what this equation says. And it includes all the things I just told you. It takes care of large masses and large velocities. It includes gravitational waves, all the things I just said. But what does this equation say? Not, I can't solve that equation. Don't, don't look at me as that I can solve that for you. Uh, but some people can, and now computers have been able to learn how to solve that. But what does this say? And I'll try to give you a picture of what it says. It says that the geometry of space and time, that's the left side of this equation, is somehow determined by the distribution of mass and energy, which is this symbol right here. In other words, the, the space we live in and the way clocks work and the way time operates is determined by the distribution of matter in that space. OK? And this is some way to imagine that. It's a completely alternative idea about gravity. Because you see, it doesn't have the force in it. And here's sort of the way it works. How many, by the way, of you know what a jungle gym is? Oh, good. I mean, every New Yorker knows what a jungle gym is. That's a big thing that's full of bars, parallel bars in all three dimensions. They meet at intersection points. And what you're looking at here, so you know what you're looking at, is you've taken a cut through the jungle gym at a two-dimensional cut through the jungle gym. And you're looking at the jungle gym, and I happen to have thrown into this jungle gym the sun. 
and the Earth, and they have done something to the space. You can see what it has done. This was all nice, regular little jungle gym square. And when you put this big energy source and mass source into the thing, it distorts the space. It actually takes curved spatial and makes straight lines into curved lines. And here is, here's, the sun, here's the Earth doing the same thing, but it's not as important. It's, it makes a little dimple in there. But more important, and I didn't put this in the picture because it's too hard to draw it, every one of these intersections where there's two bars coming together has a clock. And that clock goes, all the clocks, you stick at all these intersections, do the same, they go at the same rate. And you can synchronize them so they all are the same. But as you go toward this place where the space gets curved, the clocks go more slowly. And that's the thing, that one of the, that's the other piece of how space and time get disturbed. And you need to consider both, that clocks, the space gets distorted and the time gets dilated. Okay, that's one way, fancy way of saying it. And that a little, everywhere there is mass, there are two things happening. And now the new idea of gravity is the following. Space has been distorted, time has been distorted in such a way that the masses, these objects, move in the shortest paths in both space and time in that new geometry. That was Einstein's big breakthrough. Now, I, I'm not going to say any more than that. I'm not going to prove it to you, but there's no longer a gravitational force. What there is is space has been distorted, time has been distorted, and has changed the arena of physics. That's what it's done. And so now, let me immediately introduce you to a gravitational wave. OK. Gra I'll, uh, this is a little demonstration I will get started showing you in a minute. But first of all, let's talk about what makes gravitational waves. They will be, in the interpretation I'm telling you now, a time-dependent distortion of space. So it fits into that whole algorithm, or the whole idea that I was just telling you about. And I want to show you what that distortion does. And that allows you to imagine how we detect these waves. That's the main reason I'm making a fuss about this. So uh, let me give you a little of the properties of these waves. They, the sources of the waves are accelerated masses, masses that don't move at a constant velocity or standing still. They have to be accelerated. That makes So when you wiggle your arms like this or you rotate something, that makes gravitational waves. I also say here non-spherically symmetric. That means things that are completely spherically symmetric, like a great big sphere that collapses and expands, that will not radiate gravitational waves. There's a symmetry that keeps the gravitational waves from leaving that thing. That's just an important detail, but it's a detail. And Einstein got that wrong in 1916. The other thing, he got it right in many other places, but that was a, that's important. So now, what, is the way these, what do these waves do? These waves propagate at the speed of light. They move at the speed of light. And uh, they, they do their dirty work, or whatever they do. They do it perpendicular it, from the direction in which they're moving. In other words, if they're coming out at you, they do their stuff perpendicular to the way the wave is moving. That's what's the meaning of the word transfers. They're like water waves in water. Water wave, you, know, you propagate, you drop a pebble into water, and the wiggle of the water is perpendicular in the direction of the propagation of the wave. Think of it that way if you have to understand it. Sound waves don't do that. They, they do their dirty work along the direction they're propagating, most sound waves. So it turns out what here is now, let me turn this on and show you what the wave does. The wave is going to come out at you, and that red square, I don't know if you can see it, that's you. And it's, everything is centered around you in this picture. So can you see, and if some people complain when they look at this, they get dizzy. So if you get dizzy, don't look at it, OK? <laughs> uh, the, uh, so here's you. Nothing's happening. These are little dots of mass that were thrown out. The wave is coming out at you. And you'll notice two patterns in this thing. One pattern is that s space might be expanding along this direction while it's ex contracting along the other, and it keeps flipping back and forth. Can you see that? Yeah, OK. That's one property. Stretch space in one dimension, perpendicular to the direction of propagation, compress space in the other. Uh, but then there's another property. And that other property is, look, at, and next to you is these two little dots. They're not moving much. But these two guys that are far from you, that one and that one, they're moving a lot. And that's a pattern of 
a pattern which has in it at any one moment that the amount of wiggle is proportional, the wide amount of relative wiggle between two spots depends on the separation of the two spots. So the bigger the separation is, the bigger the wiggle. But sometimes it's inward and outward. I mean, that's the matter of what, what, whether it's compressing or expanding. By the way, you can do that yourself. You can make the same thing with a rubber band. Get somebody to work with you, hold a rubber band in your hand, stretch it a little bit, and make a mark while it's stretched, and don't wiggle it too hard, just as it's stretched. Put a mark every eighth of an inch or every quarter of an inch, and look at that, and then start pulling it and letting it come back together. You'll see that pattern, just that pattern in one dimension. And if you can take a big sheet and do it in both directions, you'll get the same thing just that's going on here. So the rubber sheet will do the same thing. So the property of the wave is that it moves at the, at the velocity of light, and it makes a strain in space that's perpendicular to the propagation direction. And the strain, is, and, and, and I say, yeah, that's it. That's, that's the two things you need to know. OK, so the first people to ever see, or, and I will say this in whoever had witnessed evidence for a gravitational wave would do these two people. This is Russell Hultz, who was a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts at the time. And this is Joseph Taylor, who was a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And Russell was sent to Arecibo, that's a big dish in Puerto Rico, to go look at pulsars. These are stars which, are, we found, which were found uh, earlier on. And, uh, these are stars that are about the size of the sun. No, I said that very wrong. They have the mass of the sun. And they have the size of Chicago, maybe. Or maybe even only as small as Evanston. I don't know. They're tiny. Tiny stars with an incredible density. A density of about 10 to, by the way, can I use, let me right away find out. If I say 100, you all know what that means. If I say 10 to the 2, 10 to the power 2, how many of you know that also means 100? <laughs> oh, great. Wonderful. And if you don't know, ask your neighbor. There's enough people around. OK. Uh, it turns out that, that, that I'm going to use that. And I wish the newspapers, when they talk about big numbers, would show you the power of 10. Instead of saying a quadrillion, billion, or a lot, it's complete nonsense. You can never figure it out. And by the way, a billion in the United States is not the same as a billion in, in Britain, irrespective of Brexit. Uh, and, <laughs> I mean, it's 10 to the 9. In, in nice mathematical notation, a billion, the one we like to do, is 10 to the 9. So 10, 9 times, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. So OK. So, uh, okay. so, the, uh, the, so the density of a neutron star is about 10 to the 15 grams per centimeter cubed, or 14, somewhere in there. And water is 1 gram per centimeter cubed. So it weighs 10 to the 15 times more per gram. So if you put a spoon in it, you couldn't even lift it. A tiny little spoon into a neutron star, you couldn't, you couldn't lift it. You just couldn't do anything with it. It's a remarkable object. And these guys went down, well, actually, Russell went down to Puerto Rico to look for these guys. And they found an amazing pulsar. The pulsar they found, and the way you want to imagine this is here, I don't, didn't put it in the picture, but imagine here's the Arecibo dish. And here is a, a pulsar that is rotating, and it, it's doing it at about 17 times a second. It really goes like a bat. And that was what they heard. They heard this thing in the, well, by the, detecting the radio waves that were measured in the dish. And what the amazing thing they heard was that it wasn't always at exactly 17 hertz. Sometimes it was a little faster. Sometimes a little slower. And what they eventually divined out of, mind you, this is a radio telescope. Nothing to look at. You don't see an image. Uh, so they heard, in the radio, they heard this in the radio telescope. They made a model of it. And the model is, these two guys, is another pulsar that is just another neutron star, a new pulsar, happened not to be pulsing in our direction. And these two guys are going around each other once every eight hours. So here's a system of little nuggets of matter going around each other once every eight hours. And that was something Einstein dearly would have loved to have, but he didn't. And they measured all sorts of wonderful things of this system just from the timing of that, pulse, of that pulsar. Imagine that. Just imagine 
learning what all the things, I mean, learning all sorts of emotions. They learn about all sorts of relativistic effects, which are hard to measure. All of this, huge number of parameters. And one of the parameters they measured was the following. How long, an easy one to measure, how long does it take for that system to go around once? The orbit time, OK? And that orbit time was changing. And that's what this picture is. And this is a picture of EPIC, namely starting in 1973 and ending in this picture at 2000. That's, that's years. You and, you and I lived through this years, OK? But some of you. <laughs> I lived through all of them. Yeah. Uh, and here is the time it takes for the, the stars to go around once. Now, what is here, these are in, uh, in, in seconds, yeah. And, uh, but they did, it's the change. They start here with that, and you'll notice this is minus, minus, gets big, bigger minuses, meaning it's taking less and less time as you go around this for one orbit. And they put the dots in the picture, what was the time they measured for the orbit. And they measured that by looking to one period of making the 17 hertz go a little faster and a little slower, just through the Doppler shift of that source in the detector that's on here. So this is a picture with these dots in it, and there's a line drawn through it. And that line is the prediction of that Einstein equation for these two objects. If that's what, the, how should they move if they are losing energy to gravitational waves? And that was the very first evidence that we in the world had that there are gravitational waves. And it ended an unbelievable debate, a debate that had been going on for at least 50 years. Yeah, 50 years about right. So now there was fi finally evidence that gravitational waves existed. You didn't measure them directly. You measured them indirectly by what they did to a system you could observe. And Einstein would have been absolutely tickled pink if he was around for this, I'm sure. So the next element in this whole story is a person named Joe Weber, who had the idea that he might want to detect gravitational waves directly. And Joe Weber was a professor at the University of Maryland. And he had the idea, along with John Wheeler, who was a very famous physicist who had been a nuclear physicist to start and had himself become somebody interested in gravity. And they came, went to a meeting in 1957 called the Chapel Hill meeting, where they sat along with Dick Feynman and a whole bunch of other very famous physicists. And they tried to figure out, if you ever want to detect a gravitational wave, how could you do it directly? And the idea they came up with is was close to this, the one that you see over here on the right. <clears throat> Here's Joe Weber working on a big bar of aluminum. It's a big thing. And what you can see, he, he's a standard man. He's not a little shrimp, OK? And uh, there's a big bar of aluminum. It weighs a lot and uh, nicely machined. And he's mounting little strain gauges on it, things that will measure if a gravitational wave has come along from here, gone through the bar, stretched it, like that picture with the dots, and he wants to see and measure the stretching by looking at the strain gauges. That's a way of measuring the amount of stretching. And that was the experiment. This thing lived in that big vacuum chamber. That's where it goes. And they, he observed these for a while. That was his idea of looking for a gravitational wave. Just from that pattern of the dots that I'd show you would be enough to give you an idea that this might work. Well, OK. What happened is he built, for about eight years, he worked on this thing. And he finally had the courage and maybe, the, maybe not such a good courage, but he had the courage to publish a result in physical review letters saying in 1969 that he had measured gravitational waves in one of those things in his laboratory, another one of those things in a golf course that's about eight miles from his laboratory in Maryland, and one right around from you here, the Eitan Chicago at Argonne Laboratory. He had one in the stairwell in Argonne National Laboratory. And he had seen Co coincident kicks of these bars. What he was looking for is the gravitational wave comes through this. It's very much like you bomb it, bop it, bop it with a hammer. It's like a xylophone. That's what he was listening for. And he heard it. And that was his misfortune. Because what happened, he published this paper. He had, by this time, run it for six months or something like that. And he was getting two or three events a day. That was coincident in all the three bars. And of course, when you make an announcement that you've seen gravitational waves, that's a very nice thing about physics, or science in general. Other people say, huh, that doesn't look so impossible. Let's see if I get the same thing. A lot of people all over the world did, this, did it. 
and they found nothing. And that was a real unfortunate occurrence. So that was the beginning of the field of gravitational wave astronomy, but it was wrong. But there were a lot of ideas there that were good. The idea of putting multiple detectors out there, the, even the idea of going looking for it was a good idea. But that system had something wrong with it. I, I, you can ask me questions about it. I don't know what went wrong. But I can tell you now one thing about it. I will tell you a little bit later about the detection of gravitational waves and the strain that's associated with that. But the detection that was made is one million times smaller in amplitude than he could have measured. So we're quite certain he was not seeing gravitational waves. OK, and nobody else saw it either. So that was the beginnings of, of this very complicated field. And then there was another idea, and I want to show you the idea. Another idea that came along from people. And what it is is try to measure this in another way. And the idea was, to, and I, you'll, this is a little animation I'll show you. And what the idea was to take, well, maybe first lay it out so you have a picture. Remember that picture with the dots that I showed you? Remember the thing I put the red square around? Make believe that this object we call a beam splitter, it's going to be a thing that reflects light and transmits light. The little red square is around this. And one of the distant dots that's going to move a lot if there's a gravitational wave coming down on this thing is over here. And there's the one in the perpendicular direction. So the, the gravitational wave comes down. Let's say pulls this guy in, pushes that guy out. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put a laser here, which you're going to turn on in a minute, send the laser light to the beam splitter. And the beam splitter is nothing more than the thing that you experience when you look into a somewhat dark room from a bright outside. You look into a store window, and the lights are not on in the store window. You see yourself. But if you look carefully, you also look into the store. That's a beam splitter. Okay? And so this is the thing that divides the light 50-50. Half of it goes reflected, and the other half will go through it. So let me turn this on. OK. All right. So the laser light is going to be red. And in it, this wiggly thing is the electric field of the, that makes the, makes the light. It's an electromagnetic field. And here it's reflecting from one mirror. And what's been done is this path is made the same length as that path. So the light takes equal time in this. And you'll notice no light. There's no red mark here. No light goes to the thing which is the photodetector, which I didn't tell you that it was. That's a photodetector. Now you wiggle it in and out. And light, when it's no longer exactly equal path, you get red here. That means you get light. In other words, this is a setup for looking for that stretching along one arm and contracting along the other. So, so just, that's called an interferometer. That's why the name is called LIGO, LIGO, Laser Interferometer, Gravity Wave Observatory. That comes later. But. So the idea was to measure this, measure the thing instead of what the gravitational wave making a bar jiggle was could the gravitational wave, the time it takes to let the gravitational wave to go along two directions inside the wave, could you measure that stretching and contracting? And you set this up so that if there was no gravitational wave there, there was no light to the laser, meaning equal paths in the two arms. And as soon as the gravitational wave comes along, one arm gets longer and the other one gets a little shorter, so the times are no longer equal and the cancellation of those sine waves are no, is no longer perfect. That's if, how many are now totally lost? Oh, come on, somebody's got to admit that. Okay, okay. There are not enough of you. I'm not going to go again. You'll have to talk to, I'll talk to me later. It, it wasn't more than a, well, I won't say anything to embarrass anybody. Okay. Anyway, so that's the idea of a gravitational wave detector based, and this is the idea behind LIGO. Okay. So along comes Kip Thorne, who is one of my colleagues. And uh, this is about 1974, 5, something like that. He knows about the field. In fact, he's trying to build a field, a group at Caltech. And he says, look, in many writings he made, if you're ever going to try to detect gravitational waves, you're going to have to get to a strain sensitivity of 10 to the minus 21. You're not going to measure anything unless your instrument is that good. And what I mean by that is this is a symbol we call the strain, H. And that's what I told you it was. It was a change in length, the, the wiggle, divided by the separation. That's delta L over L. And you had to get to a value of being able to measure such a small amount 
that's smaller than 10 to the minus 21. And that's why I like to use exponents, because you write that with zeros, you wind up a decimal point, and 20 zeros, it's just hopeless. Okay. So now what does that mean with a real system? And LIGO, for example, is a system that has an arm length of four kilometers. Four kilometers, 2.6 miles, something like 2.4 miles. And that means that if you put uh, four kilometers in the denominator here, multiply 10 to the minus 21, and find out what delta L is, you'll get something like four times 10 to the minus 18 meters. Well, what does that mean? Uh, you have to get a little feel for that. Uh, your hair is about 10 to the minus 3 meters. Yeah. Uh, uh, an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And you can just about side make an atom. You can see an atom if you want, or not. You can see an atom in your bathtub. I'll, I'll explain that if, well, maybe I should explain that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lovely experiment to do if you have kids. But you, I mean, you, need a little bit of, you need a little bit of arithmetic, that's all. Everybody knows, I, that's just a digression, and if I talk too long, you'll have to shut me up by falling asleep. But OK, what it is, is uh, if you get a medicine dropper and get a little, in the medicine dropper, you have some fluid that is, floats on water. And uh, you, with a medicine dropper, you let a little drop out into a bathtub, big bathtub, full of water. And you drop it down. And you first measure the diameter of the drop. And you know that, or the radius of the drop. And you know that 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed is the volume of that drop. That you have to know a little bit of the geometry. And you drop the thing into the water. And you see some, and you put schmutz all over the water. Put some you know, dust from the vacuum cleaner in the, in the bathtub. And then watch what happens. The thing goes splat. And it makes a big, big area that isn't got dust on it. You try it, you'll see. Now, the volume, the volume of that area, that's the height of that, you don't know. But you know the area, you can use the rulers. You measure it approximately. Yeah, this times that is the area. And then you say, OK, the volume, which is A, is some height times one length and the other length in the bathtub, that must be equal to the volume of the drop that came out of the medicine dropper. And you solve for the height. And you will find that you get the height of an atom, two atoms maybe. But order 10 to the minus 10. So it's in your capability still to measure the height. But it's, that's tremendously big compared to what's needed here. So it turns out you're looking at something that's the size of a nucleus of an atom that's 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's so tiny. But you're not there yet. You have to get to 10 to the minus 18 meters. So it's a thousandth the size of a nucleus. And most engineers, when you tell them that, that you're going to try to make a measurement of that, look at you like you've been smoking something. You know? <laughs> and uh, so what happens is, but that sets the tone for what you have to do. In other words, it sets the tone that, and this is what the challenge that Kip threw at us. He says, if you're going to, it, it comes in two places where that challenge happens. One challenge happens that you have to look at something that's 10 to the minus 12 of the wavelength of light. I didn't tell you the wavelength of light. That's about 10 to the minus 6 meters, the light we use. But the light that you see so well is very close to that. It's half of that. So that's the first challenge. How do you use light to measure something whose wavelength, the wavelength of light is 10 to the 12 times bigger than what you're looking for? That's the first challenge. It turns out that was the re relatively easier one. The other challenge is everything everywhere in the world is shaking up and down by at least a micron, which is 10 to the minus 6 meters, or a few microns. It's slightly dif distributed over frequencies. But you have to design some way that those mirrors that you put at the ends there don't get shook by the Earth. But it has to be a lot better than that. It has to be 10 to the 12 times better than what the Earth is moving. So that turns out to be the hard part, the very hard part. But when one solves that problem, you solve a lot of other people's problems, too. People who make microscopes in the city of New York in a skyscraper would love to have a thing which keeps this, the noise of the wind from wiggling the, the, the building. You can give them a device that stops that. Or people who mask semiconductors can use a thing like that. They can put more bits onto a, onto a chip. So anyway, there's some utility for some of this stuff. All right, so how do you do it? That's the challenge. I'll quickly tell you. I'm not going to tell you in detail because it's a lot of work to tell you. But I want to tell you, just give you a feeling for how you do it to, with the light. I'll give you some ideas that we use. Uh, what you see here is the same picture that I showed you in that animation. 
So you, you get familiar with it. There's a laser. There's that beam splitter. And there's that very distant mirror. And there's that very distant mirror. And there's the gravitational wave coming down on this thing. And so now you see some new stuff in here. Well, one of the new things is on both sides of this thing. And there's a detector, by the way, OK? So one of the new things is this partial mirror here. It's a thing that lets some of the light through and, and some bounces some of the light back. But what that does is it makes the light that goes in here bounce back and forth maybe 300 times. That's a crude way of saying it, but that's the effect. And the same thing here. So the light spends a lot more time with the gravitational wave. OK? Uh, so that's important. That gets you a big factor. And then there's an interesting thing. Forget about this mirror for a moment. If there's no light going to the photodetector, no light at all, where's the light going? And that animation I showed you it was screwed up. It didn't show you this. The light all goes back to the laser. That's, that's where it goes. In other words, all the light coming out of the laser hits there. None of it goes to the photodetector. That's the picture I showed you in the animation. And so well, here must be that all the light goes back out of this. And some of it gets absorbed in these optics, but it's tiny, very tiny amount. So here's a real opportunity to do something clever again. What you do is and you put another partial mirror right here. And what you do is you say, OK, here's the laser. The light hits that, and much of it gets reflected the first time around. Some of it gets transmitted, and it puts light into here and into these arms. We'll get to that in a minute. But all the light that's coming back out of here, coming back out of this thing, because none of it's going here, is going to go through this mirror. And now you have two beams. One beam that's heading back from the beam splitter, going to the, back to the laser, which would kill the laser, by the way. It hates The laser hates that. Uh, but, uh, but here's some light that is further coming out of the laser and bouncing off this mirror. And now you have two beams going in the same direction. And you can make them cancel interferometrically, just like they did in front of the photodetector. So you have done something really quite interesting. You started maybe with a 50-watt laser here. 50 watts of light. In this little thing and right in here, you might have five kilowatts of light, or no, maybe a kilowatt of light. And in here, you might have half a megawatt of light. So you've started building all the light. And this thing has, is a light, it sort of makes a lot out of a little bit of light that comes out of laser. And that's the way you win in making the sensitivity. And what you're looking for is the motion of that mirror and that mirror. So that is, in fact, the way it works. And then there's another mirror, which I'll only describe to the experts. This mirror is used in a funny place to put another mirror in front of the photodetector. Seems like a crazy thing to do. But it turns out you can tune the interferometer, how it responds to the gravitational wave with that mirror. I think I'll leave it at that. You can ask me questions about it if you get curious. OK. Oh, boy. OK, this is uh, how bad or good the system can go. I don't know if I want to go to this, except this is the noise budget of this instrument that was built. And I think I want to leave it alone except to show you something. You'll see these curves again, but I don't want to explain it completely. What it is and is that here's frequency. This is the frequency of the gravitational wave. And here is the magnitude of the strain of the gravitational wave, but not exactly the, it's the amount of gravitational wave amplitude at a given frequency in a given band. And so this tells you the noise in the instrument. I'm just going to show this probably more for the experts. Uh, here is the limit of what was the noise. This is where the, op the system operated. That's its sensitivity in, in strain, in spectrum of strain. And here you can see the things that limit it. And the thing that's limiting it here is something called the shot noise. And you can make that go down and make the instrument better if you have more light. And that has a connection to something over here called the radiation pressure noise, which doesn't seem to play much of a role because something else is limiting it here. But later on, this will be a big problem. And these two things together are called the quantum noise in the system. But limited, the initial detector was primarily thermal noise in here, the fact that everything shakes a little bit at room temperature. And the other thing was just what I was told, told you all already, that the whole Earth is shaking, and you can only do so well with getting rid of it with seismic isolation. So that's the limit of the first detector. And there's one thing in here which makes it so that if you want to and want to ever detect very low frequency gravitational waves, you're going to have to go into space. And that's a project I'll tell you about near the end. So that, that there is, you can't get rid of all the noise on the Earth. So that was the thing that was built. 
And there are, and this is ultimately what is this now a modern picture. There were several of these things built in the United States, and we'll get to that. These four kilometer detectors. One of them was built in Louisiana. Another one was built in the North Pacific Northwest. And there was another one built in Pisa, near Pisa, Italy. That's called the, it's an Italian French collaboration. And then there's a German contribution to it. There's a small, shorter detector. So you had these are four kilometers long. This one is three kilometers long. And this is 600 meters long. And that's a research interferometer. And that exists. All of that exists. And these, all these things are operating now. There is, in the future, more of these coming. And the reason is you'll become evident to you why they're needed when I get a little further into the, into the, into the lecture. And that is there is one in Japan built in the same place as the Kamioka mine where the neutrino detections were made. That's in a mine. And that's three kilometers. And then there's a detector being planned in India that's very much like the LIGO detectors, about a four kilometer detector. And why are all these detectors needed? Well, Vicky's group badly needs them. And what they are, are peop if you, you'll see presently, you need them to tell Vicky where the sources that we have detected are. And I'll come back to that. So that tells you, tells you uh, why we want more detectors. It's telling where the sources are. I'm going to give you a quick, very quick uh, 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 view of the sites. This is, by the way, the site in, uh, in Louisiana. There are trees there. And let's see if this works. Yeah, it does. So this is uh, the beam tubes. Here's the same thing up in, Louisiana, in, in Hanford. And here is a concrete cover. The beam tube is inside this thing. Here's the same thing in, in Louisiana, all the trees. You can always see it. And here's what the tube looks like. It's a thing that's highly evacuated. And it runs for four kilometers. And here's the thing like you have in your own labs, people working on laser tables inside those tables. And this is the control room for the Louisiana site. And here are people learning how to run the instrument. So that's, that's your quick tour of LIGO. <laughs> OK? I can ask me about it, but I, you know, it's a big piece of science. It isn't as big as a big accelerator, but it's not as small as a little interferometer on a table. OK? All right. And the reason I want to show you that other picture is this is a human story, not a technical story. This is the history of that first detector we built. This is the sensitivity. And you can see, and this is the frequency. There's a this is the sensitivity and strain, or in position, I don't care which. And this is the frequency. There's 100 cycles, 100, 100 times a second. And you can see that we started, and they were pretty crummy. That's back, this is all time, from 2001 to 2006. And this is the progression of all the things that happened. We started this way, and it was, now these are one, order, one factor of 10. It's one of these distances. That's a factor of 10, each one of those. So we're doing really well. Things got better and better and better and better. Finally, we got down to here. And uh, buried in this thing, you can barely see it, is the curve that you would have expected for the system to how it would operate. And we missed a little bit at low frequencies here. But that red dotted curve, which is a theoretical curve, when you calculate how such a thing should work, is buried in this low. And so we were at the limit, except for a small region down here, which is important. But we were at a limit where the instrument was doing as well as it could. It was doing as designed. And because we got that, but we also saw absolutely nothing. No gravitational wave was detected. But it was a good nothing. Okay, It's not a make-believe nothing. It was a nothing from knowledge. In other words, we could tell somebody we have seen no gravitational waves at a certain level. That was impressive to people, finally. You, you see how a thing that doesn't quite work sometimes makes things better? I, I'm trying to explain that to you. Uh, and so what happened was that uh, the people who funded us said, yeah, you made it to there. What is the cost to make it really go? And we had a plan already right from the beginning of how we wanted to do that. And they gave us the money to build something called advanced LIGO in the same facilities. And that is what made the detection. Okay. Now, what were the things that changed when we made advanced LIGO? It was working on the other problem that, Nick, uh, that, that Chip threw at us. It was a how do you reduce the amount of motion of the mirrors. That was the big change. The, the a technology that we built to make the measurement with the lasers was already developed, really, mostly. But what was not developed was all the things that cut down the ground noise. And so we built a very fancy way. Here's the mirror. And the mirror is isolated from the ground, which is up here, by a whole bunch of pendula. 
one pendulum, another pendulum, and another one, and finally that mirror. Now, I should have brought an exhibit with me, but I mean, you'll have to look at my hands. How does a pendulum stop the noise? It does it, you'll do it for yourself at home. It's real easy. And if I took my belt off, I could show, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the thing is, let's say the ground is up here, and this is the mirror down below. So if they move very slowly, this ground moves very slowly, they move together. But if I move this thing very quickly, this one doesn't move. And that's the key idea. So you can make an isolator for motions at moderately high frequencies. Those are the frequencies above the pendulum period, the period of the pendulum. And it isolates. And you do that here three times. But that wasn't enough to do it. The thing that was enough to do it is that thing was hung from this very complicated picture up here. There is that group of pendula. And what this device is, is how many of you have worked, have, have used, used my, take airplane flights and want to put a headphone on that suppresses the noise from the airplane when you want to listen to the music or whatever you are. These are called, I'm just curious, how many people have done that? I mean, yeah, a good number of you. And uh, that's exactly the way this works. So you, you measure the amount of ground motion, and that's measured with a seismometer. And then you have, you measure what's coming out of the seismometer, which measures the motion of that platform relative to all the stars. And then you have pushers, and they have pushers all over, and you make it so those pushers Null the seismometer, make the seismometer go to zero. So that means you're canceling the Earth motion by measuring the amount of motion on the platform. And that thing is called a feedback system. And that headphone that you play does exactly that. It measures the sound in the airplane. You're listening to music out of the headphone. And that microphone picks up the sound in the airplane, inverts it, flips it over, and sticks it in the headphone. And it cancels the noise that got through the headphone that came from the noise in the airplane. It's the same idea. It's done twice. And that device, if you're interested, we can, LIGO will gladly give you the designs for it. That's useful for people doing microscopy and things like that. OK? So all right, with all that, uh, OK, this is what we saw. Almost the day we opened the detector, we saw this. Now, what is this? Uh, this is time down here. And that is strain. And you notice, you may not be able to read it from where you are, but that's 10 to the minus 21. And lo and behold, whatever this is, has a strain of about 1 times 10 to the minus 21. Kip was much too good. It was right on the mark. How could he have guessed so well? I don't know. OK. So anyway, what is this thing? This is the, the, the trace that was collected in the interferometer at Livingston. And most of this stuff there is junk. That's junk. But something comes out of the junk eventually. It, this wiggle that looks like that. And then it becomes quite pronounced. And then it becomes junk again over here. Well, the same kind of thing, but not exactly the same thing, happened at the other site. OK? And this is junk, as I say. And that pattern came up also very much the same, as you'll see them superposed in a minute, I hope. And this is junk again. So with those two signals that got over the noise, and here is really when you superpose them. And they're very interesting already when you superpose them. You can see the character of the noise. They don't reproduce each other here. But over where they are not noise, they not identical, but they sure do the same kind of stuff. And then this is junk again. So what, what had to be done with the signal was sort of interesting. You had to take the signal that was coming from, from, that was coming from the Washington detector, flip it over. That's because we made a mistake on the sign of, the, of our electronics. And you had to shift it over by about seven thousandths of a second. Because the signal came first to Louisiana, and then it came to Hanford. So that told you something. That told you the signal was coming from the south. And that's the way you determine where the, signal, where the sources are. As simple and crude as that. That's all you have. You can't point these things. You can't make a telescope out of them so easily. Not with what we have. So that was the way you find out where it is. And now, what was it? OK. Well, I'm not quite there yet. Let me give it to you another way to, to, to look at it. And this is just a different representation of the same thing, which will be useful to us. This is the same signal again. These are the, this is time again. And, and this is the signal that we were seeing above in these two sites, Stanford and Livingston. But what now has been presented is a little different. It's the amount of different, what is the amount of each frequency 
of sound that's in these waveforms. In other words, you can see that over here. Here is, for example, this is 32 cycles per second, 128 cycles per second. Middle C is right about there on the piano, right about there. And there is a picture of how much <coughs> sound at each of these frequencies is in this signal. And the brighter it is, the more of that particular frequency is in the signal. So <coughs> there isn't much here, lots, and this is where we will see that. This is the spectrum, as they say, of that signal. <coughs> and this thing is called a sonogram. If you ever had a hearing test, that's what you get, OK? So the sonograms, and I will play the sonogram for you if I can get this working. <coughs> and you heard that dull thud at the end, right? Boop. That doesn't sound very good. So we've, we messed around with this and made it a little more audible. OK? Now, that's, that's fakery, I admit. But it gives you a little better. It's a, little, it's a chirp. It's exactly what you see when you look at the waveform. <clears throat> the waveform is getting more crowded together. Near the end, it's taking less time to make an oscillation. I can need to drink some <coughs> water. Excuse me. Bear with me. Hmm. So. OK, good. All right, so now what was it? I'll show you something which I think is just about as miraculous as the apparatus, and, and that as the apparatus that made the measurement. And it took about as long to do this as make the apparatus. And that is, these are the first, <coughs> these are solutions of those Einstein equations I showed you. These are not, what you're about to see now <coughs> is real calculations done by a computer using the Einstein equations. It's not an artist's drawing, OK? And it took a long, long time before people were able to put and make a computer program that actually faithfully reproduced the solutions of those really complicated equations. And now I'll show you. This is two black holes going around each other. And what you'll see in a minute is the waveform is on the bottom of that picture. And what's going on is going on in that same thing you saw with the jungle gym. You'll see a cut a two-dimensional cut across this thing. And, OK, let me tell, walk, talk to you as it goes on. You can see the two black marks. Those are the two black holes looking down on it. And the colors now represent how much the time has changed. In other words, where the color is green, it's going at a steady rate. But where it's orange, it's going slower. And where it's black, time has stopped. And those little arrows are the stresses or the strains, effectively, in that geometry. And so you see the two black holes going around each other. Uh, and you, here's the waveform. I don't know if you can see it. You can see where we are right now in the waveform. Eventually, we're going to get to the collision of these two black holes out here. And, it, and here's where you can get the time, right up there, in the time of the collision. And it's slowing it down so you can see what's going on. There's all hell breaking loose in, this, in, the, in, the, in the geometry around the two black holes. Time just stopped. There it is, boom. OK? And look at the storm that has been made in these two guys have come together, and they made a new black hole. Everything calms down, and now the gravitational waves go off. That is what made that signal, OK? And it's, a, I think, a triumph of people working on the theory and learning how to really do non-relativistic calculations, I mean, relativistic calculations on the computer. OK. So we didn't believe the thing right away. And here, but we did make an announcement which we made only after we saw more of these. But this is kind of cute. You'll like this. What it is, is I, after we made the announcement on February of 2016 that we had detected that thing I just showed you, I was sitting in the New York City subway. I was going to Brooklyn in New York, and I saw this advertisement on the wall of the subway's car. It says, scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If it only were that easy to find an apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. <laughs> now, I mean, this is a couple of days after the announcement of the discovery. And the public is talking about this. It's sort of amazing. Well, not very much later, there's a our, there's our cartoon in the New Yorker. And there's these two birds sitting up there, this, this guy and that guy. I think this guy's doing the talking, yeah. And he says, was that you I heard just now, or was that Two black holes colliding. And to me, that was an absolute miracle, that this thing got into the public conscience at, at a rate that's so fast. And I understand why it did, because it's not that difficult for people to understand it that much of it. 
And when you go to grade school, which I do a lot, and I've said this to others, and you ask the kids in sixth grade or fifth grade, name a scientist, they all know about Einstein. And every kid in sixth grade knows about a black hole. Why? It's in the comic books. It's the worst thing I can, you can encounter in your life. OK? <laughs> so you, know, it's, you didn't have to do the, quote, education that you normally have to do. This was much easier to talk about than the Higgs boson. I mean, a lot easier. Okay. Okay. So all right, that's how it, all right. So and this is some other black holes we saw quite a little bit after. The one you've been experiencing with me is this guy. This is, again, time, strain, and units of 10 to the minus 21. And the one we've been talking about is sort of a pretty big one and kind of short. These, 30, these have these 36 masses, solar masses, 29 solar masses, and three solar masses has disappeared into gravitational waves. By the way, if you do numbers for this, you'll find out that that's brighter in that little bit of time that this was going on than the entire universe by a factor of 1,000 in light. Okay? All the whole, everything, every light you can think of. This was an unbelievable event. And then a little bit later, now we know this is for real. This is an older slide, but uh, this is a real one. This happened on uh, October 12th of that same year. Here's the one that made me believe. And that's it's still in the year 15. But when that happened, I said, let's publish the paper. It's, you know, it's Christmas, day after Christmas. What a gift to get. Okay? <laughs> and uh, then there were more. And there are now many more. We have now about nine of these things. And they're all different masses, and they're different. different and so uh, I think the, I want to, instead of wait, well, taking a lot of time, I want to show you the next one which was important in this. There were others. The next one that was important was when Virgo, the one in Pisa, saw the thing also. And that happened a good bit later. Uh, what's the name of this guy? That was October, no, yeah, August 14th, 2017. And here, the, it was seen in LIGO in both detectors. It was just about seen on Virgo. Virgo is not as sensitive, but it was seen by Virgo, which was so important. And that did something dramatic. I don't know, Vicky, we, we never have been really able to ca capitalize on this, but here everybody will realize what's the importance of it. Here's a picture of the sky. Uh, you know, the sky you map out as a, And here's a, the uncertainty in the sky, that banana is the uncertainty in the sky that comes from just LIGO seeing it. But when you add now Virgo to it, which is a completely different place and different times, you get a thing which combined with LIGO together gives you a little circle like that. This is about 1,000 square degrees of unknown, and that's only about 30 degrees of unknown. Now, most astronomers, when you tell them, go look there, they still will throw you out the door. They don't like to look at something that's 30 square degrees. Why? Because they can barely get the whole moon in their telescopes. And the moon is a quarter of a square degree square. So we're not yet you know, capable to tell an optical astronomer exactly. And with that comes in a minute. But people are looking like crazy for what might be an optical or electromagnetic counterpart to this. And at least there's some hope if you can tell them a little better where to look. And that's the reason why you want more detectors. That's the lesson I was trying to tell you earlier. So that was a big event. The big event was that Virgo saw it too, and now you could get a much smaller region of the sky to tell somebody where to go look. But then we had an un unbelievable event in the same month. I couldn't believe it. This thing was, what, two, a week later? Three days. Three days. OK. What is it? All right. So now that you know a little bit about how to interpret these things, here is the sonogram for that one. It's a much longer thing. It lasts about 10 seconds. And there it is. This is the, it, it made a chirp. And you'll hear the chirp in a second. That's it. It keeps going. And we don't hear the end of the chirp, but that's, a, that's about where that black line goes up to whatever. What I'm going to tell you about what that is in a minute. So let's listen to that chirp first, OK? Let's see if we can even hear it. I, this, this is, depends on how good the audio system is. I'll try to play it. That's a good chirp, huh? <laughs> I mean, you've done a glissando on the piano. You know, that's what you've done. Okay. And uh, well, that was that. What is it? Well, we found out pretty quick. We knew about this one ahead of time. 
Not that we were going to see it, but we, this is the source that had been sort of the thing you pointed to if you're going to do gravitational wave research. Everybody looked at this. We're going to see two neutron stars. And what is that? It's one of those Hulse-Taylor things that you saw in an earlier slide going around each other and finally getting to the point where they've lost enough energy that they smash into each other. So we had warning about that. And now the part that's so absolutely charming about it is the fact what happened here. So LIGO heard this, saw it, or however you want to talk it, measured that. And then here is a satellite, a Fermi satellite. I know that, I know that Vicky has probably given you three lectures on it, but it's such an important thing I'll want to give it to you again, OK? <laughs> uh, is that, that what they saw is they saw a gamma ray burst, which is something that people had suspected might come from two neutron stars smashing into each other. That had been suspected, but never really proved. So there, that's another new thing that's happened. Suddenly, people realize, wow, there's a gamma ray burst that comes from two neutron stars smashing into each other. That's something new. I mean, now proved. And then it was seen in two instruments on the same satellite. And then it was seen by another, uh, not so well. Now, this is a pipsqueak little gamma ray burst, but it was, it's real. The big ones they see are much, much larger. It happened to be, and we'll see why that happened. So here we had suddenly something fantastic. We had an electromagnetic magnetic confirmation of an event that LIGO saw. That's very important for the final skeptics that still lived in the world about who thought we were cheating. And there were some people at the Bohr Institute who thought we were cheating. And, uh, and the other thing is that it also told you something absolutely wonderful. This time difference between that line and that gamma ray burst is about 1.7 seconds. And this thing is at about 140 million light years away. I didn't tell you where the black holes are. They're all out at a billion, 10 to the 9 light years. This is about 10 to the 8 light years away. <coughs> and so what happened is now you have something coming to the Earth almost simultaneously. It has been traveling to the other. The gravitational wave has been traveling along with the electromagnetic wave, and they've been going together for 140 million years. So how much of a difference in velocity can they have? It turns out it's a tiny, tiny, tiny number, 10 to the minus 15. Chain difference between the two velocities divided by the velocity of light. That says the velocity of light is the velocity of gravity waves in both ways. There's no mincing the words anymore. And you don't have to, you, that alone threw out about four or five I wouldn't say they were good theories, but somewhat half a, oh, oh, I, won't, I, sh I was about to curse, and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so ill-formed theories of gravity that followed Einstein. Okay. Uh, and so uh, that, that predicted that those things would travel at a different velocity. Settled a lot of problems, but it did a lot more than that, too. And here's where a whole new field got started. And this comes from the fact that we were able to tell where this was. And here's that same kind of picture. This is the picture of the sky again. Here are the bananas you would have had from the LIGO detector, another banana not knowing it. Here is the region of where the Virgo detector, if they had been able to see it, and we'll get to that, if they had seen it, would have made a detection. Now, why do I say this in this very tentative way? We knew they were sensitive from that measurement they made three days earlier. They should have seen it, absolutely should have seen it, and, but they didn't. That told us something. That told us. There was a cone on the sky, which happens to be a cone of silence for these detectors. It's about 45 degrees to the normal. Here's the normal to the plane of the detector. There's a nice cone of about 45 degrees where this detector can't pick up stuff. It was in that cone. And that allowed people to say, look, it's not in this banana. It's in this banana, but here's where it is. So a telegram went out to the world. and people began to look for this thing with real telescopes. And the, by, by the way, here's the uncertainty in the, gamma, in the gamma ray. It's much larger than the uncertainty we gave them in the uh, gravity waves. And here is a picture now that was taken of that region where this happened 20 days before. By, uh, I don't know the telescope. Vicky probably knows. And 20 days before, here is what they saw. They saw this is the galaxy where this thing eventually comes out. Here's some stars in our own galaxy. And then there's a little mark right there where the thing shows up not, about 10 hours or 11 hours after we saw it. A uh, telescope sees that bright spot right there. And all these other spots check out the same way. So 
there was a sighting by one telescope. It didn't take long before it was 300 telescopes. And all different wavelengths. And that is the connection that finally coined a word which I'm not terribly fond of, but it's called multi-messenger astronomy. And the National Science Foundation, the agency that is supporting us and has done beautifully for us and for science, has made that a big word as what should they be doing in the next 10, 20 years, really pushing multi-messenger astronomy. And we're part of that. Okay. So here's what people think it is. And there's a lot of studying right here in Vicky's group about this. So if you want to get expert opinions about this, don't talk to me. Talk to Vicky and her, her colleagues and students. But I, if I say something wrong, make sure you speak up, OK? Uh, so the, uh, the, the idea is here are the two neutron stars. They smash into each other. They make a new black hole. The gamma ray burst comes off at an angle because it's, a, it's, it's so weak. It's barely seen. And then there is something called a kilonova. That is, all that nuclear matter that has collected out of those two neutron stars gets smooshed together and makes a very hot, because this is coming, these two objects are coming at each other with almost the velocity of light, one-tenth the velocity of light. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of energy. They heat up that neutron thing, and there's lots of protons. All sorts of stuff happens. You make, you make all sorts of nuclear reactions happen. And that's going on in this region right in here. And for example, uh, uh, what one of the things that's going on there is that we solved the puzzle. Another puzzle, it's not completely solved, but it's very good suggestion that it may be solved. And it's a puzzle which has been known for years. And what you see here is the thing that we teach our kids in chemistry. This is a periodic table. And this periodic table is not quite the same one you put in the wall in your chemistry lab. It's got the same order, and it, but it tells you where the elements that are in this table were made. So for example, Blue means they were made in the explosion that started the universe. Uh, it, green is that they were made in a star that cooked them up. And here, and then got sp somehow got into the, into the system of uh, uh, the inter interstellar system. Or it came from an exploding star. And maybe it came, and this, that's color. And those things that came from exploding, colliding neutron stars are purple. And you'll notice an interesting thing in this picture. People knew that hydrogen was coming, came out of the Big Bang, and helium, which is over here, that came out of the Big Bang. But that's all that really came, a little bit of lithium came out of the Big Bang. On the other hand, uh, you got up to iron over here, and most of that was made in stars. But when you got further, much further than iron in weight, all of that, nobody quite had quite right where it was made. And they had suspected it might have been made in a neutron star collision, and lo and behold, it is. And this is circled only because people made this thing like gold, like gold and they like platinum. So the argument is all the gold and platinum that's been made in the universe, and I don't think it's completely all, but a good bit of it is made in these collisions. So, OK, so you have a little bit of this on your ring, right? Uh, OK, another thing that was quickly discovered was, and actually beautiful work, which will be going to the future, is uh, that, and this is a little subtle, and I better watch myself. Where, how do I stand with time? I have another probably 10 minutes of things to talk about. Is that all right with you guys? Five. Five. Oh, boy. OK. <laughs> I think I'll skip. I'll skip this. OK? Because it's cosmology. It needs a whole new explanation. So there are two things that you already know about. This is, again, things for the future. These neutron stars, when they collide with each other, may very well get so close that they distort each other. And that was not measured. We were, did not, our data was not good enough to do that. But somebody, people would love to measure that. And it's shown sort of in this picture. As they go around each other and they distort a tide in each other, they speed up in their rotation. And that's shown. And that's something we could actually measure. But the signals we had were not, signal to noise was not good enough to do that. But it's very important to find that out because it'll tell you how stiff nuclear matter is. It's, it's called the equation of state of nuclear matter. That's something people would love to know. There's another way to do it, which is very speculative. And we hope to be able to see this. And I'll just, I'll just tell you what this is. These are, there's a whole new ice spectroscopy of gravitational wave spectroscopy that might happen if in these neutron star collisions, which are given in this picture. That we, when these two things come together and they go around each other, there's a body made that has its own internal modes of motion. And you'll see that there are lines. This is now the spectrum. There are lines that you might see depending on how stiff the, the how stiff 
the star is, or the material is, and these are lines of, if you're above that line, you might detect it. And people are predicting that maybe if we saw enough of them, we will see this. And that would be extremely exciting. Again, uh, something for the future. OK. And now, I will talk a little bit about that. Two more slides, that's it. And this is the, the future as we see it. And this picture so gives you an idea of where we are. This is LIGO as it was when we made the detection. We're a little better off now. I, did, I should have put that in this picture, but it's, I stole it from another thing. It's in here, which is where we are now with what we have. But this is where LIGO ought to be, advanced LIGO ought to be, and we're not there yet. We have a plan for going even better, and we have funds for that, which is about here. That's called LIGO A+. But we don't have, we have ideas well how you might slowly crawl your way down here. It's very slow. We would like very much to build something which is going to be guaranteed to take this whole field into cosmology, looking at the whole universe. And there's a nice little picture that tells you this here. These are new detectors made much longer than these. These are four kilometer detectors. This is a 40 kilometer detector, the first version of it, and then a second version of it with new kinds of, of optics in it. And we start with this one. And here's sort of some of the things. You can see what happens. These are the popular, this is a, the Z. This is a, a cosmological a redshift here. That corresponds to the distance you're away. The higher that number is, the further away it is. And here is the population of all, and this comes from, this comes from Vicky and others, uh, is the population of black holes, the kinds that we've been seeing. And the A plus is this guy, or is it O3? Yeah, no, A, A plus is in the middle of it. Uh, when we get to the next run, we will have most of these guys, half of them outside of our reach, but a good half of them inside of our reach. But if we build A+, plus, we will get a little more out. And if we build Cosmic Explorer, even that one, we will embody every black hole pair that is in the universe. And that would be spectacular for doing cosmology. The other, on the other side are neutron stars, and that's not, we have to do better than that. Here again, a population of neutron stars, and here is the Let's say you get, you know, you get one or two right now per year, maybe. Uh, and that's going to be the case even with uh, A+, plus, that we get a little more. But you have to build something which is considerably different. You have to fill in, get down here, to get over the bulk of the population of the neutron stars that are in our universe. And then if you build that one, which is very much in the distance, but very much more sensitive, you will get every one of those. So that's what we think of in the future. And that's sort of the way we're planning. And we have an idea uh, about how to do that. It's a, a, a fairly decent idea how to do it. Here, then, is my last slide, and it's an overview of what the whole field is doing. And I won't dwell now on, this is now a plot that shows you a lot of other things that are going on, much as if you had looked at a plot of how is electromagnetic astronomy operating today. This would be how is gravitational wave astronomy operating today. And what it is, is this is frequency of gravitational waves. You can see it goes down 10 minus 16 hertz. Here it's 10 to the 4. But here are the times, age of the universe is that, associated with that. Here is a tenth of a second to a thousandth of a second here. Here's hours. So there are, the project you've, I've been talking to you most about is this one. And these are short period, very high frequency gravitational waves. And you've heard about those. But there's a very important project going on right now. It's almost as old as LIGO. It's called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. That's this thing. And it's a satellite system, a triangular satellite system, going around the Earth at the same orbit as, the, as going around the sun at the same orbit as the Earth. And that's been studied, to, almost studied to death now. And we, we know it can be made to work. It costs some $2 billion, probably. I mean, we think it's that. The Americans have sort of punted on this a little, which is unfortunate. And, but they're trying to get back in. But the Europeans have picked this up, and they're not letting it die. And that will get periods of gravitational waves from hours to minutes, and completely different things. Big, massive black holes, much larger than the ones we have. White dwarf stars in our own galaxy, they will be seen in orbiting. And you will also see a, a background of, of, of gravitational waves. There's different science is being done here than there. And there will be some very interesting tests of general relativity that will come out of that. Here's a project that is not as sensitive and may never really produce something, but it's clearly worth trying. And that is to use pulsars, and this is going on right now. It's, it's not as expensive as any of these others, but, it's, uh, but it still costs money, but it's not, nothing like the others. It's an idea to use the radio telescopes you have on the Earth as a way of looking for gravitational waves that are coming through the Earth. 
In other words, the idea is the following. This is for looking for periods of gravitation waves from three or 10 years to a period of a half a year, somewhere in there. And these would be very, very slow gravitation waves, but coming through our galaxy. And what would they do? They would speed up all the pulsars in the northern sky, and then sp speed up all the pulsars that are in the, in the southern sky. And all the pulsars in the eastern sky would go slower, and the eyes in the western sky would go slower. And you would look for that pattern. That's what the gravitational wave will do as it comes through our galaxy. And that's an interesting thing to do, but you know, it's a, a long drawn out thing. They haven't yet, they've got the thing working. So yeah, you use a lot of, you need a lot of pulsars to do this. And they will be much better off if we have more telescopes finding more pulsars. So maybe for the future, but right now, they don't have a result yet. And then, this is a thing which almost had a result back about three years ago, and that's a thing that is completely different. What that is, is an experiment, and it is now going on both at the South Pole and in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And these are the idea that you can look at the cosmic background radiation. That's the radiation that remains from the big explosion that made the universe. And that radiation has now been studied very, very carefully, and we know it's right. We know it's thermal. We know a lot of properties of it. The thing that isn't so well known is the polarization of that radiation. In other words, how does the electric field, that wiggling field you saw in the picture with the interferometer, how does that wiggle coming from that? And each one of these regions, there are certain patterns of polarization that would be induced by having primordial gravitational waves, waves that come from before that hot plasma that we see the radiation from. In other words, all the way back to time t equals zero plus a little bit to the origin of the universe. Those gravitational waves would perturb the plasma that makes the cosmic background. It would make density changes in it, which make these polarization patterns have a spiral pattern, well, a, a, like a, a pinwheel pattern. And that experiment is a beautiful experiment. It uses only using the cosmic background radiation. It thought it had made a detection three years ago, four years ago, it was all over the world. And what they unfortunately were seeing, they were seeing the polarization from dust in our own galaxy. Well, all right, I, I don't forgive them entirely for that because I told them that was gonna happen, but I'll leave it, okay. <laughs> See, I was in that business once too, and I know dust is poison, okay? Uh, and it's poison in your rug and it's poison in space too. Uh, anyway, so that experiment is being built better. People are making many wavelength measurements now simultaneously. They have a way of measuring the dust independently of the cosmic background, and maybe they will succeed. I hope they do. That would be one of the most spectacular discoveries of all time. Thank you. So that was an absolutely fantastic uh, lecture. I know some of you have to go, but I hope that a few of you have questions. We certainly have time for a few questions. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. The fact that, uh, okay, the, the fact that gravitational waves move at the same speed as light, is it purely experimental or does the theory predict that as well? well. Let's, you, you're asking, let me, no, but not all of you heard the question. He's asking, it, we measured that the velocity of light and the velocity of gravitation waves are the, the same. But what, does, what did theory say before that? And what does it say now? And it turns out that Einstein guessed at it. And he guessed that would happen. And why he guessed that is because so much of electricity and magnetism, the Coulomb law that you know, that the force between two charges goes down like one over the distance squared. Like in the very first slide I show you, the force between two masses goes like down as one over the distance squared. That whatever in the quantum theory mediates that field. And he didn't know it this way, but that's why he, he guessed at it. He saw that they were the same. It must be like a photon. That's the way he thought. But on the other hand, now we know a little more. The, the people who do quantum theory of fields see, aha, those kind of force laws need a particle to mediate in the quantum theory, which has no mass at all. Okay, it has to travel at the velocity of light. And that was the guess right away as soon as people saw the Coulomb law, the Cavendish law, 
and it has been, and now why did people begin to think otherwise? It's because there are aberrant theories of gravity which don't have that. They didn't have gravitational waves. Some of them didn't. I mean, I won't go into all the different crazy theories of gravity. And I'm very pleased with this because it eliminated a lot of those theories. Hi. Um, Where are you? I over here. Over here. Well, over raise here. your hand. I don't see you. Uh, look, um, this side. This side. Oh, over there. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, so when, when you look at the uh, at the wave at the waves that are coming through with that chirp or that that uptick, yeah. is there more information in that than we're seeing? That something oh, you God can yes. harvest? Oh God, yes. See, we're we're just taking the tip of the iceberg. I'll tell you what is in there, which we would love to see. And I didn't make a big fuss about that. Uh, and Vicky would love to see it in the data and see it first, I bet, but never mind. Uh, is uh, there are things, that, just take that a collision of the two black holes. There are things people want to know right away. How much are they spinning? We don't know a damn thing about that. A little bit, but not really worthwhile. You get that by getting the waveforms with, with less signal, with more signal noise. How much were the two guys spinning? We'd love to know, for example, is Hawking right? Hawking has a theorem. It's called the area theorem. He says, if you know the spins of the two black holes, and you know the spin of the final hole, and the masses of all of those, they should have a relationship with each other. We didn't measure that. Hawking talked to me. He was very upset that we didn't measure that. And didn't measure it, and we didn't state it in our paper. But we're going to do that one of these days. Those are now then. There is more, much more. The most interesting thing we didn't see is something in the following. When those two black holes smash into each other, and things calm down, the geometry around the black holes oscillates a little bit. And these are called normal modes of the geometry. We'd love to see those. They've been predicted for years. And they might even tell you what's really going on at the horizon of the black hole. I don't know. I'm not promising that. But there are a lot of I feel people think if you could do that with enough single noise, you could learn something about what the horizon really looks like. And, so, and then there are other effects. There are effects, for example, which of pretty wild effects that, that waveform, the nonlinearity of gravity, the nonlinearity of gravity, which means that gravity begets more gravity, makes an interesting effect. It's called the Christodulo memory effect. If you get a waveform that wiggles like that, there should be a slow little DC term, very low frequency term, that picks up and stays on forever. And we'd like to find that. There are all sorts of pieces to this, which are confirmations of, let's say, the inner workings of general relativity. And maybe, I can't promise this, something, I don't think, I don't know how to do it, something about the quantum theory of gravity. See, that's a badly needed theory. I think that we're going to learn something about the quantum theory if we ever get to seeing gravitational waves from the, the moment of the creation of the universe. That's when I think we'll learn something. I mean, there's lots more to go. And the neutron star, the same way. I, I told you a few of the things that, that come with things if you had a more careful measurement than neutron star. So this is just the beginning. We're just starting. Question on your left. Oh, I have a couple of questions. Where uh, are you? Is the gravitational uh, spectroscopy one way to probe for the existence of this proposed quark star? And, and what about the, uh, the quantization? Wait a minute. I, slowly. Uh, I, I didn't understand your whole question. No. Say it again, please. Uh, can you uh, detect the so-called quark star from the... Uh, what is the, I don't know what that is you're asking. Well, there's been proposed that a quark star is intermediate... Between, quark stars? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, quark stars. And what's the other part? Uh, the other question I had was about the, uh, the so-called wave-particle duality of the gravitational radiation. Can we detect a graviton like we have a photon through this methodology? All right. And so you're asking two questions. What about quark stars? How would you distinguish them? from black holes or neutron stars. And the other question is, what can we measure about gravitons? Is that, OK. Let me start with the second one, which is actually unfortunate. I don't think we're going to ever learn much about gravitons. I hate to be such a pessimist. And the reason why is that what, what do we know about gravitons now is only it has to be when we have a proper theory of, of gravity, quantum theory of gravity. It has to have zero rest mass. It can't avoid that. And it has to have spin. We can't avoid that either has to have a spin of two. And that's just from the way the, the field interacts with matter. Now, does it really obey that the energy in the graviton is h times the frequency? I don't know that. We haven't got any evidence for that. OK? It'd be nice to prove that, but now comes the trouble. 
or the statistics of the gravitational waves we see. When, when, you, you could, when you want to look for the photon, another way to do it is just to look at weak fields and you see the, the, corp, corp, the, corp, the, you know, the corpuscular nature of the signal. It doesn't come all smoothly. It comes in little bursts. I don't think we ever will see that. And the reason is that we're looking at signals which are very, very classical, having, I don't know the number, but it's certainly over 10 to the 18 gravitons in, them, in, in our detector. And I can, we can barely detect those. So I don't think we're ever going to see a single graviton. And even an experiment that's being thought of here, which is to try to do this at a higher frequency, where the energy per graviton will be higher, has absolutely no chance of doing this. So I, I don't think we're ever going to get near a graviton. But I do think we will be able to tell the difference between a quark star and other stars. And that will come from the oscillations of those stars and also if they happen to come in pairs. We can't see. We, you know, I have something I haven't even told you about. There's a whole bunch of people in LIGO trying to look for a single star, not a binary, a single neutron star spinning. And if the, and this may be one way to go at it, but I think it has to be a pair. Then we can do a lot with it. Or a, or a black hole with a, a quark star, or a neutron star with a quark star. It's nice to have a pair, because then you get a real signal. But then you can solve for it. And you can probably separate the two. But I can't promise you that, but that's the chance. But I'll tell you, there's another way people are looking for gravitational waves. It's for looking for what's called CW waves, waves that are in continuous waves, not burst-like waves. And for example, if you have a neutron star, which is spinning like mad, like one of the ones I told you about, and it's a little bit elliptical, like an American football, and it wobbles as it does this, which it will, that will radiate gravitation waves. It's a spherically symmetric thing, won't gravitate radiate gravitation waves. But something that's spherical and wobbling, and that happens a lot. For example, suppose you take the Earth and wobble it and, and spin it faster. It'll radiate gravitation waves because we're not completely spherically symmetric around the axis of rotation. And the magnetic field has squeezed the Earth a little bit. That happens with neutron stars, too. I mean, it's an exaggerated example. But if there's any ellipticity and it rotates, you'll see that as a continuous wave signal. And if you once see a continuous wave signal, people will begin to get ideas of what relates the radius of that object, what the moment of inertia of that object is to the amount of gravitational wave they see. And they might discover new stars that way also. But my guess is it has to be the best if it was in a binary. But I think we could, I think we could separate a quark star from a neutron star. But I don't think we'll see a graviton. I wish I could, but I, can, I can't encourage you there. I, yeah. Hello. Yes. Where? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm probably not understanding this in the right way, but uh, do gravity waves distort space and time itself? Yeah. Uh, if so, would this like imply that there is like some kind of space-time fabric or ether through which they propagate? OK, I think the question is, let me, add, let me change your question a little bit. Not that I'm only going to answer questions I know, but I want to clear it up a little bit. Is, I mean, you're asking, is there scattering of a gravitational wave as it travels through the universe? Is that, is that the question you're asking? Yeah, I, guess. I, think that's what, I think that's what it is. And yes, there is. Of course there is. And for example, one kind of scattering, which we'll certainly see at one time, is once we know a little more about the universe and the sources, but we'll have to go out further, is we'll probably see bending of, of gravitational waves by heavy objects. So they can do exactly what light does. That's one thing. So that's one kind of scattering. But the scattering that reduces their amplitude, which is like what happens in electricity and magnetism. I mean, I, I don't know. If I, have you ever explained the index of refraction to yourself? How is it that when you put light into a piece of glass, it seems to go more slowly? than it is if it's in, in, in air. That's all due to the fact that the light goes in. And this is the same thing that you would have to do with, with gravity waves. Light goes in. It induces dipoles in the medium. These dipoles, which are charge-separating things, will make new radiation. And they, they make their own new waves. And you have to add the incoming wave that excites them with the radiated wave by the molecule or atom that's there. And when you add them together, there are phase shifts that are associated with that. And it looks like, it very looks like the envelope of the light is going more slowly than, than, the, uh, than it is if it's in vacuum. Now, the individual elements of the light are still going at the velocity of light. It's sort of interesting, each of the individual elements. So that's a way of explaining the index of refraction. And now, you would get something like that if you could induce 
here's a gravitational wave coming along, coming through matter, and it induces a quadrupole moment in the matter, which it will do. It'll move the stuff, just like you saw in the picture with the dots. Those will re-radiate gravitational waves. So the problem isn't that that doesn't exist also for gravitational waves. It's in the details of how much. It's so small that it doesn't affect anything. And, yet, and that, 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 that's, you have to make the numbers. It isn't just in the concepts. Yes, there is scattering, but it's so small it doesn't matter. And you can take a gravitational wave through all of what the universe is, and you see none of the scattering. There will be no attenuation of the gravitational wave. There will be some bending of it, but no attenuation whatsoever. Now, there is attenuation, of course, due to the fact that it's moving from its source and it's spreading out. That I'm not talking about. That, that's, it goes down as 1 over the distance. Not, the power goes down as 1 over squared the distance, but the amplitude of the field, amplitude of the strain, goes down as 1 over the distance. That will, that's just diffusion. There's no, there's no scattering associated with that. One more question, time to time, um, I don't hear. That's OK. I think I can hear you, and I'll translate it. Uh, from time to time, one hears about extra dimensions. And it is a very provocative idea. Uh, one doesn't have any experimental proof for uh, extra dimensions yet. But can such a question be addressed by observations that you have been talking about? OK. Let me repeat the question so everybody knows what it is. And then you uh, nod your head if I have it right, OK? I just want to make sure that I'm not saying something wrong. He's asking, what about multiple dimension theories, higher than four dimensions? And will looking at gravitational waves give us any kind of clue about, is there a world which has more than four dimensions? We, you have to buy the four dimensions. I can't give you the three. We live in four dimensions, and you've got to live with that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the thing is, for example, it depends. I, I, I'm going to make up an answer you won't be happy with, OK? But I can't do much better. There have been five-dimensional theories that people thought were seen in nature. And the Kaluza-Klein theory, which is something that was done very shortly after general relativity, it's a theory from, was a theory which used geometric ideas. Kaluza-Klein. You, you know about that? Well, it's the two guys, Kaluza and Klein. I, I don't know where they were. One was in Germany, the other in Poland, I think. And they made up a five-dimensional theory. For those of you who are experts, they didn't demand that, this, that the metric tensor stay symmetric. They allowed it to be, uh, have an anti-symmetric piece. And that anti-symmetric piece, which is in, the, in a way the fifth dimension, was a way of explaining electricity and magnetism. So this was a way of embodying in the fifth dimension all of electricity and magnetism. And it worked fine, and everybody thought it was very happy. And Einstein was delighted with it until nuclear physics started. And it wrecked everything. And you know that because you're a nuclear physicist. So I can't tell you anything about the modern theories of you know, string theory and the multiple dimensions. I just don't know anything about it. I'm sorry, I just don't know. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, the entire mass goes into gravitational waves? Yeah, yeah well, I don't know why not. I mean, there's no theorem that I know of. Do you? Do you know a theorem where? I, I, it must be a very strange collision, but look, it, happened with, it happens with Hawking radiation. You can do it that way. But uh, that, you know, that's electromagnetic radiation. You can eliminate the black holes completely. Uh, but I, I don't know exactly. I don't think there's a conservation law about that. I think energy, it's, you, I think you'd have to look at, yes, I see. A place where it might violate is Hawking's area theorem. I'm not sure of that. I don't know what happens in, in, in Hawking's area theorem if you start with initial case, two, at two areas, and you wind up with no area. That I don't know. It may violate that. I don't know the answer past that. So it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs>